All right, welcome everyone. My name is Brian Gregory and I'm the president of Aldridge. We're excited to host another discussion related to the challenges businesses are facing and how they're using technology to overcome those challenges. A lot of the discussions we've had so far this year have really been focused on the events of crazy 2020 and how organizations are reacting to, to those changes and, and, and just keeping the lights on and keeping things moving. But I'm really excited for today's discussion because it's going to be more focused on the changes we can make now in our businesses that will have, have an impact on us in the future to make us all stronger businesses. The topic we're discussing today is centered around how you as a business can modernize your data strategy and get, get out of the legacy mindset around just reporting on what has happened and start analyzing that data uh, to help you make decisions about what you can do better in the future. Before we dive in, just a couple of housekeeping items. We have some prepared content to get the conversation going, but we want to make sure that we answer the questions that are most important to you. So please submit your questions. I'll work, th I'll work those in in the conversation as they seem natural, or we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, if for some reason we don't get to all of your questions, we'll be sure to respond back to you directly with answers to your questions. So even if it seems like we're getting a ton of questions and you don't think we're going to get to it, send it in anyhow. We'll make sure that we we get that answered for you. Also, we wanna to continue to host events that are centered around the challenges that are actually meaningful to you. So after this event, you're gonna get a brief survey. Please, please, please give us the feedback. Let us know what you, what you think about this event and what you'd like to see from future events. Okay, so let's dive in. I'm joined today by some great panelists. Uh, first and foremost, Anthony Bonaducci with the RAND Group, Chad Hyatt, who is our CIO here at Aldridge, and Krista Curet with Complex Conquest Completion Services. So thank you all for participating. And before I start with the first question, would you all briefly just tell us a little bit about your organization and what your responsibilities are? And Anthony, I'll start with you. Fantastic. Well, first off, obviously, Brian, uh, I want to give you guys a big shout out because this was your idea. So thank you for... Uh, coming up with the idea to host this great session. Big thank you to Krista, obviously, for uh, joining and, and being kind of our uh, voice from the client side. So we really appreciate that. Um, obviously, Chad, thank you for jumping on and helping organize as well. So my name is Anthony Bonaducci, as Brian mentioned. I'm uh, vice president here at RAND Group. I'm over our data science group, which covers all things reporting, analytics, budgeting, planning, forecasting, you know, some light AI and machine learning type exercises we've done for clients, but really all things data. Um, and, you know, in my past life, I guess I'd add this, I was a executive at Microsoft's largest third party reporting and analytics provider. So this has really been my passion, this type of uh, discussion, this type of work for, I guess, going on a decade now. So it's something I really enjoy and I'm really glad to be here. So thanks again. Thank you. Krista, how are you? Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Krista Curet and I am the VP of Engineering and Technology at Conquest. So we are a client of RAND, and um, we're on the service side of the oil and gas sector. So we provide completion services such as coil tubing, mixing plant chemicals, and flowback um, for EMP operators. So we kind of started this journey into um, ERP world and reporting about two years ago. Um, it's been a fun journey so far, which we'll talk about uh, during today's session and look forward to any questions um, and any help that we can provide to you guys trying to figure out if this is something you would like to do. Fantastic. Chad, last but not least. Uh, I'm Chad Hyatt. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Aldridge. We're an IT outsourcing provider providing managed services and all the pieces that bring together IT for our client organizations. Uh, CIO within Aldridge, I actually have a bit of a dual role in that I'm both the CIO for Aldridge, but I also get to work with a lot of our client organizations and helping them understand how their business initiatives click into IT initiatives and how the IT initiatives are there to support the overall business drive. And data analytics reporting often comes up in the conversation of we need more information to be able to run our businesses effectively. So I'm really excited to be part of the panel today. Thank you all. Uh, just a reminder to all the attendees, please ask your questions at any time. Let's not wait till the end so I can work those in as we go. Uh, but to kick things off, Chad, you, you mentioned you work closely with our clients to discuss how they can use technology to solve business challenges. Data analytics is a topic that should play a role in that. 
how are you approaching this conversation with clients that maybe aren't quite adopting this just yet? And how, how are you approaching it and how are you getting them off go? Well, a lot of times the conversation doesn't start with data analytics. Data analytics is more of the, the technical term to it. What it usually starts with is someone within the business saying, I could do better if we knew this, or if we knew this faster, or we knew this information better to be able to, be able to support a decision. And the conversation then usually goes towards, well, let's look at what information you're already gathering, what data is there to start working with. And realistically, most organizations start to realize, wait, we're already working with Excel. We're already modifying bits of data in there. We're producing these reports. And so it's a process of refinement of finding, well, what information do you already have? How can you look at it in new ways? And then moving up the chain to figure well, right now we're doing it with manual Excel spreadsheets. Maybe we're going to start moving into automated reporting so that we have that information faster or in a more timely way. We all start to agree on what certain things mean consistently throughout the process. And some organizations have actually taken those steps and they've gone all the way up to now they've got automated dashboards where they're able to start seeing that information and drill into it in real time. And information becomes part of the organization's vocabulary. Very good. Krista, I think that's a good transition to you. You've done some very impressive things and we're excited to have you on as a real life example of some of the things that you can do here. Um, why don't you just give us an overview of how you got started on this journey? I know it can seem like a daunting task to a lot of organizations. So how did you get started and what are the, some of the things you've actually imp implemented over the past year? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we started this journey about, it'll be almost two years in January. And essentially, um, it was brought to the table. We were on QuickBooks and a lot of Excel-based reporting and pretty much operations was on Excel and, and paper. Um, we moved the organization to literally <laughs> fast track cloud-based reporting, cloud-based ERP, which um, we chose the Dynamics 365 side of it for finance and operations and field service. And what that did was is it bridged the gap between our operations team where we could get data, literally input and reporting off of it, as well as the financial data. So where we sit today, October, you know, is not where we started January 1st. Um, there were a lot of pain points along the way, a lot of lessons learned. But essentially, we realized early on that the system is only as good as the information you put in, which people will tell you this all the time, but systems don't fix the world. So essentially, the reporting tools are great if at the baseline you have the correct information in, everything is set up correctly, and you understand how to get it out. So for us, some of the pain points were literally I'm just understanding where the data was and how do we get to the data and use it. At times, you know, everybody has an idea of what they would like to see, how they would like to see it, or some people have no clue. And I feel like the best bet is to really research it and talk to people, whether that's in the same industry as you or even outside of the industry, because the reality is, is reports are reports. So it may not be specific to your business or your organization, but it at least gives you a baseline and an idea of what you can do with certain, you know, like Power BI or BI 360 or whatever the reporting tool may be. Um, so it's definitely been a, a great journey and we're looking forward to 2021. We're definitely gonna have Anthony involved in trying to take our transition to where we are now with the database and how, how we look at it today to hopefully some data breaks and where everybody in the organization can actually do their own reports. And we show up to the meeting with the same data. Uh, the one thing that we've learned is that I can create a report, Anthony can create a report, Chad, you can create a report. And if we all create our own formulas for that report, we might get three different numbers. Well, who has the truth? With the, with the data bricks, I feel like it's important because no matter how we look at that data, we'll all three have the same answer. So it's just kind of for us now transitioning to focus on 2021 and taking all the lessons that we've learned and the pain points and, and building on it. I've got a lot of questions for you, but I'll, I'll circle back. Um, Anthony, or Anthony, I want to just yeah. pop over to you. Um, <laughs> you guys are truly an expert in this field, and you're having conversations, obviously, with your clients in multiple positions in the process. Clients that are just wanting to get started, what do those conversations look and sound like, and what, what are some of the obstacles that you see people facing to, to get them off go? You know, that's a that's a good question, Brian. Actually, there's a lot there as well to unpack. So I'll try and do it as succinctly as I can. But I think the biggest challenge with our clients and, and you know, even in my past life at Jet, our, our biggest challenge is we're getting people to realize they have a problem. And so 
that's something we've been trying to do and be very proactive with with our clients. But the bottom line is, if you look at reporting out of an ERP, it's suboptimal, period, across any ERP, okay? Uh, and for a number of reasons. One is it's uh, extremely technical, right? You need a coding background. Or you need to be able to understand every single table and field. You need to know where the data lives. A lot of the pains that, you know, Krista and her team were feeling, right? But for some reason, reporting, even though it's such an in incredibly important uh, process for a business, people are kind of okay limping by, right? They don't mind waiting two weeks for IT. I mean, they're not happy about it, but they, you know, they'll wait two weeks for IT to turn around this report or, you know, they'll, you know, the CFO will sit there and she'll tap her foot for, you know, a couple of days and put pressure on folks. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're still okay with it. I think getting people to understand that it's not efficient. Um, ERP reporting is highly technical, as I mentioned. It's rigid. It can't do everything you want. It doesn't consolidate between your different data sources. I mean, we can get in, into that, I'm sure, later on a whole other topic. But, you know, businesses have more data than ever. They've got more data across more sources than ever. Um, and so I think really the biggest challenge has been just getting people to recognize that there are other solutions out there and there's better solutions. Um, and we're not talking small potatoes here. I mean, this is something where the investment into this space, into third party reporting, into data, into analytics is skyrocketing, right? I mean, we're seeing tool, you know, Workday acquired Adaptive Insights for almost $1.6 billion. Tableau was acquired by Salesforce for almost $16 billion, right? This is not stuff that people are doing as a one-off anymore. This is something every business should be addressing. Um, and I've got some fantastic statistics I'll share later on, but I mean, if you look at um, you know, a broad sample of executives across a number of businesses and all different size and shapes, the investment being made into data and analytics is uh, you know, at levels we've never seen before, right? So it's, uh, I think the biggest issue to be succinct is just getting folks to understand there's a better way to do it. Very good. Talking about that investment, Krista, I'll jump back over to you. How did you guys get off go as it relates to setting a budget for this type of initiative? And if you don't mind sharing, how how well did you manage to that? Did, were you were you able to stay within those confines, or did that get of out of control? Not. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> uh, you always plan for at least twenty percent overreach. Um, but no, I mean realistically for us, um, the reporting side of it was part of the ERP implementation. So in hindsight, twenty twenty, I probably would do them side by side, but do them as separate projects and a separate budget. Because the reality of it is, is you have to have the right people in the room from the people that are going to be using the reports, the people that are going to be inputting information into those, you know, to, for you to get the information in the report, as well as your mid-level management, your high-level management and executive team. So my recommendation would be have all these people sit in a room and truly understand where the data is coming from, where it's going, why it's important, and show those guys that are inputting that data, like who it affects. Because the reality of it is, is there's a pride and there's a, a certain, you know, kind of stigma where I'm just putting in information, who cares? Well, the reality is if someone cares, and it's not just the CEO, but all members of the organization teamwork wise care. So for us, we kind of did it all in one stop. So we, we went live, we did reporting, everything. And we thought, keyword thought, that we had everything under control. And we understood, okay, Power BI could do this, would have BI 360 for this, not knowing that really the, it's, it's like an oyster and full of possibilities. So sitting here today versus when I was you know, sitting January 1st, 2019, um, mind blown, because the reality is, is I would have done a couple things different. And the main one is literally doing a simultaneous pat and not collectively, because like Anthony said, you know, you have can reports in all of these ERP systems. The reality is, is they're garbage because it's not the information you really need. So no matter what, you have to have a reporting tool or your teams are gonna go back to Excel. And the point of spending millions of dollars on an ERP system is not to use Excel. So for us, we kind of had to take some step backs, um, learning pain points of what do we really want to achieve? And for us and my team, we did some research just on our own. And what we started doing is actually just creating reports. So we would create reports, put them out there to the accounting team, put them out there to the operations team, and say, hey guys, is this something of value? And sure enough, they would say, oh, this is great, but could you do this? Or can you do this? Or can you add this? So what happens is, is no, none of us know what we don't know. And sometimes experience is the best teacher. And for us, experience literally has taught us a lot. So at this point, you know, our organization is using it. If they want to know, hey guys, we need to be able to compare very quickly um, 
one line item uh, across an inventory or a sales invoice or et cetera, what was used the most? You can create the report in two seconds and they literally run the data. Whereas before they probably would have took mm, a couple hours or two to three days. Even with months in close at this point of just trying to get data in, um, going to a, a higher level ERP system meant that we could try and shrink our months in close. That's important to most businesses because that way you can get real time analytics. And the whole point of the reporting tools and some of these ERPs is to truly get analytics and have your executives, your mid-level managers be able to make decisions for the company and to make real-time decisions. So if we have something happen in October, it does us no good to kind of react to it in January, right? Because now we've had three months past. So if we can sit here in October and by November 5th, really analyze and see what happened, you can literally make real-time decisions. So for us, it's been a lot of kind of ups and downs. And I'm sure any organization, no matter how perfect you think the implementation went, no matter how perfect you feel like your reporting tools are, you're always going to learn and the system's evolving. You may figure out you want to report off of this. You don't have it in the system. So then you have to go back and put it in the system and then figure out how to get it out. So it's a constant journey uh, that we're on, but it's been an exciting one. And it's been pretty great because we've been able to do some internal documents for accounting, operations, et cetera, but also external documents that goes to our clients and it's kind of a custom, customer facing document to where we literally can give these guys KPIs, analytics uh, for wells and things that we've done. And on some level, we've done that before in Excel, but you don't really trust the validity of all this data. And literally it takes people hours and hours and hours of time to create this. So now we literally have a click of a button. You still have to go back and check, but it's 10 times easier, faster, and the investment was definitely worth it. And we were not on budget. We're still not on budget. Uh, because what they don't tell you is once you go ERP, there is never a cutoff, uh, no matter what, no matter how great or an expert, you know, you have in your team and organization, something happens that's outside of your control and you're still constantly going to spend money. So uh, just be ready. So you're, you're obviously spending, and I'm sure not an insignificant amount of money. It, does the organization see that ROI and do they understand how how by being able to leverage something like this, what, what that impact to the bottom line is ultimately going to be? For sure. So, I mean, just in general with months and close, it's just one very quick example. Um, that's a quick win in terms of ROI because now you can see things that you weren't able to before. Likewise, that with the reporting, um, from a competitive advantage from a lot of our customer or our clients, or I mean, sorry, our competitors, um, they're nowhere near what we can do on the reporting side and as quickly as we can provide it. So even if they were try, would try to imitate what we would do, it would all be in Excel and it's not real time. So that return on investment is huge in terms of just gaining one new client or two new clients. The, the investment itself pays for it because we're giving these guys something that typically is not seen and they appreciate it. Anthony, as it relates to the investment needs that folks have to, to make to really be successful in something like this, what do what the conversations look like with clients that are a little anxious going into this, that this is going to be something that's going to spiral out of control on them? It's going to be uh, a giant investment that they, they didn't expect. How, how are you talking to clients about how, how to invest in something like this and, and what they'll ultimately get out of it? Well, so I can tell you one thing with our clients, we're really big on, on demonstrating the value of the ROI, right? So um, these, you know, one of the reasons I've stayed in this space for so long is because of the massive impact it makes and because of, frankly, the very fast, you know, kind of time to ROI on, on these types of initiatives, right? Uh, you know, we work the, uh, we're working with a client right now where their month end close uh, from the time they closed and getting their reports is, you know, three and a half weeks, right? And we're getting that down to seven days. I mean, that that alone in a couple months is going to pay for any of these types of solutions you see. And to Krista's point, there's obviously oftentimes anytime you work in a consulting role, there's going to be scope creep. And what I find kind of funny too, is we see oftentimes, you know, you fight this battle uh, with certain folks to get them to understand this value and understand why they need to do this initiative and almost liken it to like skydiving, right? The first time you're up there and you take that jump out of the plane, it's terrifying, right? And then all of a sudden you get that adrenaline rush and you just want more, right? So the amount of times we've scoped out some defined kind of walk before you run type initiative with, with analytics or data or reporting. And then, you know, a couple of days later, you've got, you know, CFO going, well, could you do this? And wait, wait, now that I see this, could we have this as well? Is this possible? Well, I've needed this report, you know, and all of a sudden 
it's like, yes, we can do all that, but none of that's in scope for phase yeah. one. So, you know, we can do that, but we got to talk about it or we can train you to do that, but it's going to take, you know, a couple of days to get you trained. So um, I, I think we see uh, kind of both sides of that. And then, you know, the other piece I'm trying to think of that, that Krista mentioned that was really good was just around, um, well, I guess we touched on the investment. Uh, there was one other point I had for you, Kristen. I'm losing my train of thought. But anyways, to Brian, to your to your point, I think the value is there, and it's tremendous. It's one of the easiest, I think, things to pencil for people typically. Um, and it's not a job security thing, but I mean, oftentimes organization someone to sit there full time, three days a week, whatever it is, sit there and just go into Excel, dump data, consolidate it manually, and they lose all the detail. It they can't actually figure out what happened. Yeah. You know, it's it's a assuming process and like I said for some reason there's this mentality that well you know it works or broke don't fix it kind of thing but it can definitely be improved and the number pull out you know at the time right very good Chad popping back over to you for some practical examples that you you see with some of our our clients um, our clients range from 25 people to multiple hundreds what what are some of the practical pain points that you've seen them address and, and fix by taking this type of approach? So regardless of the type of company, everybody's got a widget. You've got an engine that needs to produce something, whether it's a product or you're doing custom fabrication or you're doing mass scale manufacturing or you're a service company. Um, I, one of the ones that comes to mind is a manufacturing group that does custom metalworking and custom fabrication products. And their key question going in was, how do we know what to tell our sales team is the lead time for the next project that comes in? How long is it going to take to produce the next widget? And their current accounting system understood that an order was placed and they understood that an order was delivered, but they didn't have any detail in the middle. And so this organization started just by taking that data out of the accounting system, realizing, hey, we can do more than just the reports that are built into the accounting system. We can get the data out of it. Now we can start even with Excel, and we can do pivot tables and say, by category of order or by type of order, or scale of order, how long does it take to deliver? Which that answered one of the first questions. So now they're able to start providing feedback. Maybe it's a week's delay, but they can provide feedback about what work and process looks like versus what anticipated delivery time looks like for certain categories of orders. But that, of course, then changed the vocabulary of the organization. So now the organization's looking at weight. How can we figure out why it took this amount of time for this order? At how many stages did that have to go through? At how many points was it just waiting for the next work unit to begin versus how much time was it actually spent on the work unit? Which has led to another conversation to say, we don't have that information in our accounting system today, but we see the business value of getting that information. We started with one question. What's our lead time on a new sale? How, how fast can we get a product out there? And it has now opened up a whole new conversation about how do we track our manufacturing process such that we can actually refine our capacity and improve our capacity, improve our delivery time, reduce our lead times without a headcount change, but maybe just process changes. Find the bottlenecks and eliminate them. That's part of the conversation now. Yep. Krista, I know... Driving adoption is one challenge, but it seems like you've overcome that. Now, how are you managing all of the requests that are coming in that people are now excited about what this can do for them? How are how are you handling those incoming requests to you? How are you knowing what to focus on first? You obviously can't do everything at once. Just talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, to Chad's point though, the main question is the why, right? And to define the problem. Like that. that's kind of the biggest deal of you get to an ERP or a report, like why? And then what can I get out of it? Um, so for us, even with adoption, right? Like we are about to release a new uh, maintenance program on the field service side, uh, because why we realized there was a problem and we needed to understand how long it would take if a piece of equipment was down, why it was down. Maybe we were waiting on parts, maybe it was inventory. Maybe we were spending way too much with one vendor. Um, all these things can be answered, right? But if you don't have the framework built into the system to get it out, it's really hard. So then we're all still sitting here kind of doing one of these or Excel and nothing's wrong with Excel. But when you have these systems and you're trying to get this information out of it, you just got to make sure it's in. So for us on the flip side, user adoption was a really big deal. Um, we made sure that we, we trained, we trained, we even trained, trained, overtrained, and 
in some cases you have turnover. So you have to plan for brand new people coming in, training again, um, user adoption again. But at this point, I think we're pretty stable. Um, the organization has taken a hold to it because now some, some jobs are a lot easier. Uh, before it was like, wait a minute, I feel like this is a lot. It was kind of overwhelming. And now it's like, oh man, we can do this. We can kind of get this out of it. This is great. So the user adoption side for what we can get out of it has been amazing. Um, people are actually, you know, excited, taking pride in inputting information. If we make a change, we explain to them why, and then they understand it. So it's even better. On the flip side of that, though, with the user adoption, there are requests and you, you can't, you know, deny the request. So we may have ops guys that want to see a report one way. We may have our accounting team, finance team that wants to see something this way. Uh, those all take time. We're a very small team and a lean organization. Um, so for us, prioritization typically becomes what we feel or what I deem the most important. And typically it's financials, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to know where the money's going. You have to know what it's doing so that they can make informed decisions. And when they're requesting this information, it's for a reason. And it's for something that they're working on. It's high priority. So typically they kind of cut the line and then operations, depending on what it is and <laughs> what day of the month it is, literally, if it's the beginning, middle or end, they may take priority. Um, so we're trying to balance the requests as they come in, as well as what we deem that kind of the organization needs. And then, like I said before, we provide feedback. Um, one of the biggest challenges has been the blank canvas. And I'm telling anybody sitting in my shoes that was, that was there January 1, the blank canvas effect is a real thing. So, you know, everybody wants a report and they think they know what they want. And in their heads, they can kind of tell you. But the reality is, is you have to figure out if what's in their head can be pulled out of the system. So most of the times it's a lot better to show them something and let them provide feedback and give it to them than just the blank canvas. Even if you have the stick figure and not the full blown person, at least it's a start. Very good. We, we've talked about a few different tools today. We've talked about Power BI, we've talked about BI 360, we've mentioned data warehousing. Uh, Anthony, for those that are on the call that aren't in this, already and they don't know what all this is. Can you just give us a quick overview of, of the tools that are out there and some of the most popular ones and how people decide which one is the right one? Yeah, so you know, I think the second, uh, second piece you mentioned is probably the most important, uh, but I'll cover both. Uh, you know, how do we decide? Well, you know, that's why there's people like Aldridge and Rand Group, right, that, that you know, understand these tools, understands the solution. So the, the first thing I would say is, you know, talk to us, right? We, we can help you and guide you through this. That's what we do. Um, you know, we vetted these solutions. I can tell you our team personally looked at probably two, three dozen different tools that cover different spectrums and have strengths in different areas. And we parsed that down to probably six or seven that we think are really, really a good fit for our clients. Um, but as far as different tools that are out there, uh, they all have specific niches and, and benefits, I think. So it's kind of, a, again, kind of almost like the way my team does it. We almost prescribe the, the solution based on the pain the client's feeling. But there's things like Power BI from Microsoft. It's a fantastic solution for data visualization, dashboards, things like that. It's got a real low cost to entry, but it does require some technical know-how unless you have, you know, a data warehouse or a true business intelligence backend. There's tools like Jet Analytics, which is really great for taking data from a number of different solutions or different systems putting it all together and giving you that holistic view into your business. And a lot of people like it because it's inside of Excel. Um, so, you know, it's friendly and familiar when you actually report on it. There's things like Solver BI 360, very great solution. Uh, you know, again, plays really well uh, across a number of ERPs, but uh, gives you more of a cloud-based feel. There's things like Adaptive Insights, really good for FP&A, financial planning and analysis. So if you want to do budgeting forecasting, I would typically have a Solver and Adaptive come to mind out of the gate for most of our clients. Um, there's things like Tableau, you know, great. Again, it's almost like a Power BI data visualization solution, but uh, frankly, a little more costly to spin up, but maybe a little more robust. So, um, you know, I, I didn't even hit on all of them. There's so many different solutions out there. Uh, but what I think is important is if you're interested in this, which you should be, you, you just have to talk to someone. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how it's all going to start. You got to talk. You got to tell what you want as a business. To Chad's point, the data is probably there. It's just a matter of figuring out, you know, what you want out of the data. And I even call it the whole, you know, graduating from reporting to analytics. A lot of folks have mentioned this theme. I know Krista talked about it, Chad talked about it, but, you know, reporting is looking back at what happened in my business. So, you know, what were my sales last month? How many people did we hire? You know, uh, where did we spend our money last month? 
But the problem is that always falls short. I mean, think about it in your shoes. If you're wondering, okay, I, you know, our sales were $10,000. Why were they $10,000? What did we sell? Who did we sell it to? Those are the natural questions that are, that are going to come up. And so when we talk about graduating from reporting to analytics, we're talking about going from, you know, what happened to why did it happen? And the reason we often prescribe these solutions is they facilitate that really well. They let you get into the data. Um, you know, if you're doing the Excel copy paste and manually consolidate, you don't have drill down. So if you want to know, hey, what made up those $10,000 in sales? You know, most of these tools let you push a button. Boom, there's all the transactions directly from my database. You don't have that in Excel. So I think uh, it really depends on what you want to get out of a tool, what, you know, what the pains your business are feeling. And then, you know, there's tons of solutions out there that can, uh, you know, be prescribed to fix those issues. Very good. Chad, I know with working with our clients, there's new, there's new applications outside of the reporting applications, but there's new, just general applications that they're using in their day-to-day -day business. So new new forms of data being introduced, new ways of entering that data, which therefore I'm assuming introduces some complexity as to now, we, now we've got somewhere new that we've got to go pull data from. How, how's that impacting this conversation and what any advice to organizations on how to manage through that? Sure. Um, for the organizations that have already started down this path and they're realizing the value of the information that the that is inside their systems, that it's not just a, a black box that I'm putting data in and I'm using whatever the manufacturer's reports are. We try to make sure that data visibility is part of the system requirements. It's part of the consideration. When you're selecting between product A, product B, and product C, products A and B that have an open access to the back end data or some mechanism to get to the back end data without putting the integrity of the system at risk win over product C, which is a closed system and you can't pull the data out of it. Once you start seeing that your systems have that method to be able to get to the back end data, to be able to pull it or to be able to interact with it in some other way, bringing it in and incorporating it isn't as hard as just making the organization aware that we now have this additional data set. And then making sure that its source of truth aligns to the other sources of truth that are in the organization. If I've got, for example, a, a new HR system that's doing time tracking, I, I was mentioning a manufacturing example. If that's where my time cards are going, well, I need to make sure that the time card entry system I have here with an employee ID number aligns to what my ERP system is using for an employee ID number. Now I can relate the time entries against the individual projects and the tasks that they were tied to. As you're bringing new data in, it's just important to think beyond just the one product that you're introducing and think how it's going to integrate to the overall information set that the organization has available to it. That really is leading more towards getting from crawling up to walking up to running with it. And now it's part of the organization's vocabulary. And to Anthony's point, and even to Krista's point, you start getting people in the organization that now just start going out and expecting that data to be there. They expect to be able to interact with it. They don't need a central group to handle every request. The group shifts to more of a mindset of, I'm going to enable the organization to use the information and the data that's there. We're going to apply our expertise to handle the really tricky ones, but our job is to get the information out to you so that you can interact with it in ways faster than we could even do internally. I want to make sure that you've got the tools at your desktop and you've got the knowledge on the back end to support you to be able to use those tools so that you can answer the questions that you need. And all answering it from one single version of the truth. I think that yep. that's one of the things we've all struggled with in the past is we show up to meetings or we're looking at data and it's data is all over the place and one person pulls it one way, another person pulls it another. And so that's, that's just one of the benefits that I see is, okay, at least now we're all talking about the same thing and, and we're, we're making decisions based on the same metrics there. Absolutely. Anthony, when we were talking before, you were talking about report portability, and I think this ties into the, the landscape of changing applications. What can businesses do to make sure that if they're going to make this investment now and they've got this ERP or they've got this application, what do they need to do to be able to make sure that that time, energy, and money is not wasted if they need to make a change in the future? Yeah, so this is this is a huge benefit. And in, in fact, when you mentioned kind of you know penciling out the ROI, this is something we always talk to our clients about. So, you know, here's one of the other issues with ER reporting, and I've seen horrible numbers on 
if all of your reports are built off of your core system inside of that core system and you decide to move to a new ERP platform, those are all gone. You know, you crumple those up, you throw them away. And I've seen uh, folks move systems and 60% of that new budget is just to rewrite reports. You know, there's a big pain point there, especially when you look at um, our current business world where folks are more agile than ever, there's more systems than ever, technology stacks are growing like we've never seen before. Um, and so one kind of thought that we introduce to a lot of our clients is the concept of report portability. And what that really means is you're kind of free to move about the ERP country, if you will. So you can basically go uh, you know, from a Dynamics ERP to NetSuite or to SAP or whatever it may be. Um, and your reports, theoretically, if built correctly off the right source, are just going to continue to work. And so what we do for those clients is we address kind of something Chad just mentioned, which is really, I guess, to put Chad's thoughts into, into one word, it's data warehousing, right? It's taking data from one place, another place, our old system, our new system, our historical data, and putting it all into one database that's designed for reporting. And if we're reporting off of a data warehouse instead of the source data, you can kind of imagine those reports will just continue to work off of the data warehouse. So we take that new system, we move the data we want into that data warehouse, we kind of map it and tie it together like Chad mentioned. So we say, well, customer number in this system and the new system is equal to number in the old system. So we map those together and all those reports just continue to work. So it actually, you know, it pay, these initiatives pay for themselves on a day-to-day -day basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, but long term there's intangibles that a lot of folks don't even think about so uh, that concept of report portability is huge being able to move around systems as your business grows and continue to just keep using those reports you're comfortable with and anthony you had pointed out in one of our earlier conversations as well that organizations don't have to invent data warehouses from scratch that there are definitions for certain industries that are available that you can buy a functional set and you yes. can effectively purchase a vocabulary and then just start populating the vocabulary with your own data. Yes, yeah, this one kills me too because I'll have folks, you know, say I've got a CFO on the phone and you know he's saying, well, believe me, I've used data warehouses before. I used one 15 years ago at so and so, and I'm like, you know, that's like being like, you know, I drove an electric car. The first one wasn't very good. Well, now they're pretty dang reliable, right? So it's kind of the same concept there. Um, and yes, you're right. Back in the day, I think it was a lot of heavy lifting and it scared people, right? That you heard data warehouse, you thought, oh, this is, this is going to be expensive. It's going to be time consuming. I'm going to be paying some, you know, developer for years and years to keep building this thing. And that's not the case now. Just like anything in today's hyper competitive, you know, business world, they've innovated too. So a lot of these solutions that we work with for our clients, for example, have a pre-built data warehouse, right? They've got modules like sales, finance, inventory, AP, AR, manufacturing, whatever, out of the box, ready to go. Um, you know, those install in a couple hours. And then from there, it's kind of, okay, great. That's the standard set for a manufacturing company. But what about your business? What else do you And So it's more of just tweaking it. Um, there's also automation tools that you just have to code this stuff, build it all from scratch. And these tools do it in a 10th to a 20th of the time. Right. It's drag and drop all the codings written by a program. So, I mean, this is an industry that is, like I said, a multi-billion dollar industry. It's developed. It's much more mature. So um, if you've ever looked at it in the past, I guess, to check, I would say, you know, revisit. Right. Things have changed a lot in, in, in the last even few years around this technology. Very good. Um... Krista, I actually have a, a question from someone. Did you implement an integrated field service solution with the ERP? And if so, can you speak to the hardware and implementation of introducing technology to the field? Um, example, field hand using a tablet to enter information in real time. So yes, so we, <laughs> we actually implemented the, the field service component, which is the operational piece. Um, and a lot of people use it for retailing. I think we were um, kind of some of the first to go down this road in terms of a service company, uh, because realistically, they're kind of built for the Maytag repairman, right? So I can dispatch a van. Um, I'm going to go fix something for two or three hours. I come back. Um, what we do is a little bit next level in terms of the duration, the amount of equipment, the amount of people, and the amount of information we have to track. Um, so we have limited the field service component of it as well as the um, tablet version. So everything is essentially cloud-based. 
So whether we're online or offline, we can input data, but there's also an app version um, where we can give a mechanic, we can give a supervisor, and they can input it. They can even do it from their phone. So the user adoption was, was extremely high for that, but true story, the guys actually prefer to do it on the computer. So our thought and mindset was, oh, they, you know, they would love to do it on, on an app and we can refine and et cetera and do that. That wasn't the case. No, they still like to sit and be able to type and see and, and kind of navigate it that way. Um, whereas our film mechanics actually prefer the computer or the tablet. They won't use the computer at all because it's literally very, it feels the same as their phone. They're able to get to the same information, but that's a one-on-one -on -one versus a supervisor being responsible for about 15 to 20 pieces of equipment and people. Um, so to answer that question, yes, we did implement the fill service side and it was pretty awesome because otherwise, even if you implement FNO, uh, which is the financial component of ERP, you still have to get the other data. So we would have still been forced to do Excel or some other third party uh, bolt on. Um, so it's been great. Very good. So we've talked a lot about the data and data in versus data out and We've, we've got data in multiple multiple applications and all that kind of thing. How to, and Chad, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. How can an organization prepare for the future? I mean, uh, Krista talked about the, the blank canvas before and there's so many options that are out there. Uh, but how, how can they start now with knowing what data am I actually going to need? And how can I start preparing for whatever those potential questions that could come up? Um, is there any any insight you can give there? Well, I'm going to present a cautionary uh, that ties into the blank canvas issue that Krista brought up. Don't get paralyzed trying to analyze and select the best of what's going to be perfect three years from now if it's stopping you from doing what you need to do today. Deploy the systems that you need to do today, and if it's really that you have to focus in on the software features because product A has 80% of what you need today, great. Get rolling with it. Make it happen. The, the data analytics conversation, the data information, the reporting, data warehousing, all of those things follow behind systems that are already in place to handle the transactional needs of the business, and they let the business then move up to the next level. So as they're selecting tools, they want to make sure that they're selecting tools that have an open architecture, something that you can interact with the data behind the scenes, something that you know this is not just going to be a black box unless the value of what that black box is doing is so high and so critical to the business that there's no other choice. You have to do that with the understanding this has a one-year life cycle. This has a two-year life cycle, and we're going to put this in place with the expectation we're going to replace it. But the cool thing about it, which is what Anthony alluded to, is that you aren't locked into product A for the life of the company. You can change products along the way if you've thought about the critical information flows that you need from a management perspective, from an executive decision-making perspective, and those tools are abstracted one level away from the tools that you're actually using for transactions within the business. Now you could change the product to something different, but your reports, your analytics, your management tool set still stays the same. Krista, you, you talked a lot about what you've accomplished and it's very impressive. If you could rewind the clock and go back, you've touched on a few things that you'd do differently, but anything else you'd like to add there? I think the main one is, is uh, don't be afraid of the reporting side and don't think of it as truly just reporting, but um, futuristic of what you can get out of it and what you can see. Because I mean, like Anthony said, to his point, most of the information has been historical. But if you can go more now to predictive and better planning, um, that's really the true return on investment. So for day one, I mean, another main point we would do or I, I would recommend it, which we had these conversations internally, uh, would have been to literally kind of wait. So like roll out the FNO side first and then kind of get comfortable and make sure that the framework is set up correctly and you can at least get the information, the correct fields in and out. Then kind of do the field service or another operational piece or et cetera. So you roll them out kind of separately and stage them. And then the last component, while you're, you're doing the implementation, the whole entire way is thinking about reporting and kind of capturing information, whether that's Excel, jotting it down on a sheet of paper of what you think you would need from the system. And then talk to people such as the RAN group or your IT group and say, okay, hey guys, what would be the best approach or the system in terms of software package to get what we need out? Because for us, it was kind of like, these are your two tools. So you're gonna have Power BI, Visual, you're going to have BI360 financial. And it's like, wait a minute, if that's it, 
You know what I mean? And and we come to find out that no, you can do, I mean, it's using the same data warehousing data. It's using the same back end data. So yeah, one may be better in terms of presentation for a board meeting or just reporting for generalized, you know, sessions over the other, but it's still the same data. So trying to figure out what you want to get out of Power BI, figure out what you want to get out of B3, BI360 and empowering your teams to truly understand from the management level what you want to get and what you want to achieve. Because sometimes I, I think you leave your personnel and your people to kind of, it's like fit for themselves in terms of thinking versus saying, hey guys, this is just one objective. You don't have to have 50. On day one, you may just have one simple objective that may grow to 20, but you don't have to be afraid to say, man, I need like 70 today. And if I don't get those 70, the project's a fail. It's not a fail. It's just, you have to stage it in the right amount of time and be realistic with the expectations of what to get out of the system, how much time it takes to actually get the data to human readable form where you can interpret it and just grow the business from there. Yep. Yeah. And and Brian, if I can say one thing too real quick on this, because I think bridging the gap between Chad and Krista, one of my favorite terms about this type of exercise, about when, when organizations are looking at reporting analytic, and analytics is analysis paralysis, right? And that is the worst thing that can happen. And what I, what I mean when I say that is it's the thought of you're so worried about getting it perfect out of the gate that you do nothing. And doing nothing is the worst thing you can do. You're doing nothing, right? So what's beautiful about these exercises, about addressing your reporting, about addressing your analytics, about addressing your data, is it should grow with your business. You do not have to get it 100% right out of the gate. In fact, there's, you know, and don't take this the wrong way. This isn't a scary thing. It's a positive. But if you implement like the, the, the beautiful situation that could happen and should happen is if you implement a solution to address this, it starts providing value right away. Because you're getting value, you're getting better insights, your business grows. As your business grows, your needs change. Your, your, uh, the information you need to continue to grow changes. So your solution grows with you. Find out something that's really hurting in, this, in, you know, in the reporting, in the analytics. Find out the data you're missing. Start there. It will grow with you. I promise it, it happens with every client we work with. So the worst thing you can do is analysis paralysis, sit there, put everyone in a room behind closed doors and try and figure out how to get it perfect. That's never a recipe for success. You got to get out there, start tackling the challenges and you'll tackle the rest as it grows. Any other, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, as Nike says, the slogan is literally just do it. It's kind of, you don't know what you don't know. And like you said, the paralysis of you just sit there. So it's like, you want it to be perfect. So you kind of just keep spinning in what if, what if, what should I do? And sometimes you just got to take the leap of faith and just do it um, and, and just start one at a time. And it's amazing how these things transition and grow. And from to, even for me sitting here today, from a year from now, um, it'll, to, it'll be totally different because we will, we will have learned so much more. The system itself will have changed. Um, a lot of these software packages and tools add more functionality based on the feedback that the users give. So, I mean, it's an ever-changing um, thing, which is, which is pretty awesome. I think in a lot of ways that just parallels the way that business works. Because you don't think data analytics, data warehousing is not a unit of a product that I bought it, I'm done. There we go. I now have it. Really what you're doing is you're changing the vocabulary inside the business. You're enabling the business to better make decisions, respond, be informed, be able to predict the future even. Whether you're looking for patterns, you're looking at expansion, you're looking for new product lines, you're looking for new geographies, you're looking to see what's next, what's our headcount need to do in order to achieve those next level business initiatives. Analytics, it, once it's introduced inside of an organization, whether it's just getting better with the next incremental tool, whether it's Power BI, and you just start there and start moving up the stack as it makes sense to be investing in it, as you're building your skill set, it's now part of the organization. And the organization just has the expectation, ideally, that it's always going to be there, and we can ask that type of question of it, we can get the information that we need, and it's there to support ongoing decisions. Just like a business is not static, an ongoing concern is not static. You don't one day look at the business and say, well, that's perfect, let it run, do what it needs to do. The organization changes, analytics change with the organization. And I'll say this um, for people that think that Excel goes away, um, it doesn't. I don't care how much money you spend on an ERP. Um, pivot tables, Excel is still a great tool. And we utilize it even still today uh, with Empower BI. So we do a lot of reporting um, that's tied to our system, but it's also some things you just don't have in the system. And you're not going to link every single thing at times to um, the back end. So essentially, we're still utilizing Excel. So if that's just a baseline of where you start, um, at least just take the step. Touching on that, 
do you have a challenge with people reverting back to using Excel inappropriately now that they've got another mechanism to, to get the data or to analyze the data? Is that, is that a real challenge that you have or are people adopting this in the right way? Not really, because at this point, there's one version of the truth. So some of these times they can't build it in Excel. So they're literally exporting the version of truth that we have and utilizing it. So there's really no fear of kind of manipulating it unless they just go in and manually override it. And at that point, that's something they have to explain. Um, so for us, the user adoption side of them just, you know, having something completely off um, is not a concern because they're using the same data that we provided just in Excel. Very good. The, the next level conversation above that is when the people out or in the, the periphery of the organization, the actual people that are working with the information, build something cool. And then they take it back to the data team and say, I built this cool and this is working what I need. They, they've built the stick figure. They've even flushed it out a little bit. Yeah. And now they're coming back to the data team for additional expertise to say, I built this. Now I'd like to make it better or I'd like to make it faster, or I'd like to make it in real time, or I'd like to add this additional piece of information. And the important part is the data team is cheering those efforts on. It's like, that's amazing. Let's take that. And then the data team has the option to either provide supplemental expertise to get someone over the hump to take it up to the next level, or the option to say, that's so good. I'd like the data team to take that over and bring it into the report portfolio that we're now presenting out to the organization. You'll that's get accredited this asset came from you. I want to let the organization know that this was the result of your efforts, but now we'll actually take ownership and drive it up to the next level because you've got an amazing start with this. Yep. yep. Yeah, and, and speaking of, I mean, you used a word I think that, that is relevant uh, and, and really should be uh, kind of explained even further, which is cool. Um, the impact that cool can have in a business is actually pretty uh, amazing, right? When I was at Jet, one thing I built for our sales team and, and you would not believe the results we got from this, but I built our sales team this dashboard that we left up on a monitor and it was a fish tank and I built it in Power BI. Each of the salespeople had a fish and as they sold, their fish grew bigger. The competition that came from that in sales was paramount compared to when we had a, a, a little whiteboard with here's your sales versus you know, her sales versus his sales. Then being able to visually see, well, I want to be the big fish. The sales skyrocketed. And it's a true story. So, I mean, there's stuff you can do that's cool and fun using that data in the business that's actually massively impactful. Pretty much. Krista, I've asked you a lot of questions, but I think this is the most important one. You, you've done all of this. You made this investment. If you had to do it over again, would you do it again? For sure. Um, sitting here today, I mean, even, even if we changed nothing, right? And it was the exact same as today, I would. Um, because literally from where we were as just an entire organization to where we are now, it's, it's amazing. Because I mean, for, for people to think about this in, in common terms, you go from literally a paper business to a cloud-based business. And that's not an easy feat by no means. Um, it takes the entire executive management team from the guys on the ground that are doing the work um, to come together and kind of have a commonality. So for us, I mean, that was great to be able to bridge those worlds, bridge the gap, and for everybody to understand that, listen, this is a common purpose, a common goal. We're trying to make people's lives a little easier and streamline it, but we need the information. And information is power and knowledge is power. So for us doing it again, for sure. At this point, still sitting today, I feel like we're at day one, uh, which is why we will have missed, you know, Anthony. We're in a downturn. So the reality is, is like 2021, as kind of we see things level off. Um, we want to take our business to phase two in terms of reporting. And, you know, like Chad said, I mean, we, we want to empower people and we want to empower our teams to be able to build their own reports because I think that's the next step, right? Uh, the first step is, okay, what can we do and what can we see? Great. Now, how can we use it and how can we empower them to use it to be able to build their own tools? Because it, at that point, it's still one version of the truth. And I feel like that's just a great victory and a win to not just have your data team do it, but also everybody in the organization to be able to contribute. Very good. Anthony, Chad, anything, any final thoughts before we, we part ways? I guess my only thought is, like I said, I mean, take the leap, have a conversation, you know, whether you call Aldridge, call us, I mean, just talk to someone. If this is interesting, um, you know, I'm a big believer in education before taking the next step to talk with folks and just, uh, you know, hear your challenges in the business, talk about things we've done in the past for clients, you know, give you the, the confidence that they can be addressed. 
Um, and believe me, I've seen more times than I can count the person that does that and takes that leap, they end up being the hero, right? They're the ones that uh, the business looks at and says, I'm really glad you had the conversation. So, uh, you know, it's worth the time, have a chat and we'll uh, hopefully figure out how to help you guys. Very good. Jen? And I would say we've had a lot of conversations about data teams and, and personnel and, and getting the expertise in-house. In a lot of organizations, it's a person that wears one hat that does just the data services, that understands the database systems. But in more organizations, it's a whole bunch of people wearing that hat part-time because they understand how the business information flows. I was working with a group just in the last couple of months where it turns out that the three partners are the strongest people that understand the data of the organization because they understand the organization's vocabulary. And they're the ones that are then pushing to say, we need better information, but they've already taken the steps to drive that as a culture. Now they're starting to look to say, okay, now we need to pull in outside resources to do this better, faster, because we need to be focused on the business. The data analytics portion we've got rolling, let's keep that going. The, um, there was a, another important piece to it, which is getting started frequently just means understanding the first question or the first answer that you're trying to get. And if you look at your business initiatives, what are you trying to accomplish for next year, for the year beyond that? What are you even trying to accomplish this quarter? What information are you lacking right now that is making that decision harder? And if all you do is just pose that question, if you write that question up on a whiteboard, say, great, what information do we have today that can help us answer that question? That then starts down the path of, okay, let's start using our information in a more productive way. Very good. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I, I really enjoyed the discussion. It's, it's nice to talk about some meaningful change that we can make and something we can do that's going to have a really good impact on us in the future. And so appreciate the panelists, you joining us, all the attendees. Like I said, please take a few minutes, fill out that survey that's coming your way right after this. We want to make sure that we're providing information that's valuable to you. And we'll be doing more of these in the future. So we want to make sure that we're doing topics that are, that are timely and relevant. So Thank you again and have a great day. Have a good one.